something really important in the process that I learned from teaching composition is separating generating from assessing from planning. When you're writing, you're writing and you're not worried about if it's good. Then you look at what you have and you assess it. Just what's there, what's it doing? And then you figure out a plan of what you want to do next. A hypothesis is a work of imagination. It's a prediction. It's an extrapolation and devising experiments is hugely imaginative and innovative and creative. Hello and welcome back to Eclectic Spacewalk. I'm your host, Nicholas McKay. Today on Conversations, we are joined by Jamie Green. Jamie is the author of The Possibility of Life, Science, Imagination, and Our Quest for Kinship in the Cosmos. Her writing focuses on space, astrobiology, policy, and everything science. We talked about the writing process, teaching, science fiction, and mainstream culture, and the possibility of life in the cosmos. Before we play the episode, I would ask you to like this video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us grow and reach more people, as well as continue to have more interesting discussions with eclectic guests. Also, tell us in the comments what your favorite part of the talk was and who we should invite on next. Now, on to the discussion. Welcome to Conversations, Jamie Green. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, uh, so super interesting book. Uh, I took a look at it this weekend. We'll get into it more later in the episode. But first off, let's let's go back uh, to your humble beginnings. You know, where are you from? Um, I grew up in the suburbs of New York City in Rockland County. So how, how many epic trips to the city did you partake in? <laughs> All the time. I mean, like, you know, I had family in the city. We were like maybe an hour drive away. So went there a lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Were you uh, big into any of the museum scenes? Uh, yeah, et totally. Yeah. I mean, the Museum of Natural History was huge for me. I feel like I, I grew up there, you know? Okay. Well, take us a little bit about uh, some of the things that maybe topics of curiosity when you were growing up, like what were you most curious about? Yeah. I mean, I, I loved all sorts of science. I, you know, I especially loved like astronomy and physics. I remember on one particularly nerdy play date with my best friend in fourth grade, we watched a Nova special on subatomic particles. <laughs> oh, whoa, okay. So like that was when I learned about quarks and I thought that was really cool. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, always loved space, like for as long as I can remember. I mean, big ups to Nova and PBS, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like the uh, huge uh to getting into such a such a young child so early I know. Um, especially about a subject like that that's so interesting yeah um, did you ever have a like kind of a i mean who who was kind of pumping your curiosity did you have a, a teacher were you naturally curious a cool uncle like who, who i the, think it was i think it was mostly my dad and my grandfather on my mother's side so my grandfather was an engineer and mm -hmm. a gardener um and so he was always showing me, you know, things about how the natural world worked. Like I remember um, oh, okay. we were eating like peanuts one day and he showed me half of a peanut. And, you know, when you split a peanut in half on one side, you can see the little germ. And I remember him mm. pointing to that tiny little nub and saying, that's the thing that becomes a peanut plant. You know, it was <laughs> things like that. Um, just really like explaining how the world worked, just, just in explaining it. And that was enough to pique my interest and sort of my curiosity. Um, I also remember, I don't know how old I was, maybe six or seven, him taking me to watch a lunar eclipse one ah, night. You good. know, it must have been one that was timed not too late in the evening, you know, before bedtime. Um, I remember watching that with him. We would go to botanic gardens, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then my mm -hmm. dad, I think, has always liked space and sci fi and things like that. So my dad is the one who taught me. The names of the constellations, you know, the like three of them that you can see <laughs> from Queens. Um, and also, you know, took me and my sister to the Natural History Museum, just sort of gave us all of that. And then my dad was the one who got me into Star Trek, which was pretty big for me. <laughs> well, can you talk us through a little bit uh, more, I guess, on that? And maybe we can kind of go into popular culture a little bit more. Um, I mean, recently, I mean, I can think of 
many movies that kind of stirred my kind of thing, especially Arrival, I think is kind of up there as my number one. Uh, but there's many, many kind of different things. Like t- talk us a little bit about your, I guess, uh, pop culture uh, with dealings with space. So you started with Star Trek and then have you moved on, expanded? Yeah. What have you done? <laughs> so I think Star Trek came right around the same time for me as A Wrinkle in Time. I know I read oh, A Wrinkle okay. in Time yeah. at the end of third grade, and I was probably seven or eight when my dad first started us watching Star Trek. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I think he just put it on because he had watched the original series when it was on. And so he put on Next Generation one day. Um, and like, I, I don't know exactly when it was, but I've been like, well, I think it was season three or four. So that's that's my math. and. You know, those were the beginnings of it. A Wrinkle in Time is like sort of a space story, sort of fantasy, but it really kindled that sense of wonder about what was in the Mm -hmm. world. And that whole series of books really infuses a sense of magic into the stars. Like Mm -hmm. um, the, the three witches who show up to guide the young heroine on her journey are dead stars who gave up their lives in the fight against evil and now they're you know these like spirits who show up as weird old women um and there's there's a lot about um you know the stars and the music of the spheres as this sort of like mystical magical meaningful world and Mm -hmm. i think that um that really set me on my course you know obviously i was also reading like the babysitter's club i wasn't just reading you know, mystical, beautiful Mm sci-fi, but growing mm -hmm. up, I was a huge reader growing up. Um, Like I recently posted something about the book on Facebook and my aunt, my dad's older sister, who um, had a house right by the beach in Far Rockaway when I was growing up, which will be meaningful to anyone who Mm -hmm. knows New York City, but you know, right on the beach. And so we used to go there a few times a year and she commented something like how perfect it was that the little girl who was always like up on the third floor of the beach house reading instead of going to the beach had now written a book. And I really just like, I read voraciously. And so for books, it started with A Wrinkle in Time Um, by the time I was a teenager, you know, I was just reading all the sci-fi I could get my hands on at the library. I read all the Dune books, all of them. (laughs) I even like got a little bit into one of the ones that like Frank Herbert's son wrote, but then, but I like then went and like found the other Frank Herbert books on the shelf, Mm -hmm. you know? And it was like totally self-guided in that way. You know, this was before there was much on the internet. So I was just like, I don't know how I found Dune. Like, I honestly don't remember. But then I just was like, all right, what else did he write? And he had, you know, has some more space themed stuff through this whole time. I was watching Star Trek then I was watching X-Files when I was closer to the end of high school. I read The Sparrow by Mary Daria Russell, which I also write about in my Mm -hmm. book, which is just like a beautiful, compelling alien story um, where the the first people to make it to the alien world that's been discovered are a mission of jesuits you know sort of carrying on their the (laughs) joke is like it's monks in space but it really makes a lot of sense where they were like oh more of god's children let's go Mm -hmm. know them Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. and so that was a really big one for me um and i also and I'm, i'm actually working on an essay about this right now um Another book that I read when I was growing up that I am realizing really primed me for loving alien stories was The Clan of the Cave Bear by Jean All, which okay. is about a young girl. It's set, I don't know, 40,000 years ago in the Ice Age. It's about a young girl who's orphaned and is adopted by a clan of Neanderthals and is raised by them. Nice. And it's intensely researched. There's so much world building. I mean, there are just like pages of lists of plants and the animals Mm -hmm. it's so beautifully written but it really is an imagining of of a meeting between two alien kinds of people two alien intelligences alien worldviews um and so that even though it's set on earth in the past rather than in space or in the future really is an alien story and was like very formative for me as a as a young reader and I read that series just over and over and over again just like and they're also like big door stoppers like mm-hmm. a proper sci-fi oh, yeah. book so oh, the, this... that was another important one for me 
that's that's super interesting uh and but a lot of these like that you were kind of talking about is fiction did you ever kind of go into some non-fiction areas because like i guess i mean i'm i'm with you on fantasy especially dune i read the it, before the movie came out uh mm -hmm. two years ago i read all seven as well even the books yeah. by his so I, I got I into mean, i tell people <laughs> i tell people and in, in case anyone is wondering stop after book three yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's so off the rails. And that's you're a like, good point. I know they're getting bad, but I just and there's no closure at the end. It no. ends on a cliffhanger. All no. the rules of the world change. It's yeah. those books are infuriating. Stop after book three. Yeah. There is no satisfaction coming for you. Well, but the, yeah, the thing so I thought I also, about for nonfiction, sorry, it was, yeah, was yeah. a short history of nearly everything. Bill Bryson just so blew I, I didn't my mind. You know, <laughs> I didn't read that until I was older. But when I was in high school, I worked at a bookstore, and they had a, it was a Barnes and Noble, and they had a policy where any book that they had at least two of on the shelves, you could borrow ah, because okay. it was so cool because cool. they wanted the booksellers to be well read and know the books and be able to recommend books and keep up with things. And um, so that was when I read, that was when I first encountered Carl Sagan, when I first ah, read okay. Contact and Cosmos. Yeah. Gotcha. So that's fiction and nonfiction, but I read Cosmos and loved it. And that was a similar, just like, it covers so much ground. Mm -hmm. I learned so much, thought about so much. Um, it really just sort of opened up my mind. So that was, that was the big nonfiction that I remember reading. I don't think I read a lot of nonfiction when I was growing up. I mean, now I write it. So yeah. I tried to catch <laughs> it's up more a now. little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For sure. But it didn't occur to me to write about science until I was in graduate school. And I, while I was, you know, being a voracious reader and and loving science. I also, my whole life wanted to be a writer, but I would write stories, you know, because what I read was novels. And so I was mm -hmm. like, okay, I'll write fiction too. Um, and so like when I was in college, I did creative writing, I did fiction, um, but I took one creative nonfiction class, which was all that was offered at the time. It was like very, very sparse offerings. Mm -hmm. And so years later, when I was wanting to come back to writing, I thought about what I really loved in college. And I remembered that class. And so I sort of got started writing nonfiction and that just like really clicked for me. And it was then that I started, you know, reading a lot more in all kinds of nonfiction, but it took me a really long time to be like, oh, I love science. I love writing. <laughs> put them together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it seems like a simple thing now, maybe in retrospect. But I mean, I guess, can you walk us through, like, so your beginnings of writing, you want to write stories, you're kind of getting into these creative writing things. But then yeah. kind of take us to like your editing and, and take us up till now, I guess. We don't have to get to the book just yet, but kind of sure. take us in a little bit of a journey. <laughs> yeah. So um, in undergrad, I was a theater major and they had a really good thing at the time where anyone could do a creative writing thesis. You didn't have to be an English oh. major. Okay. So, um, so I was a theater major and then I did creative writing and, um, you know, wrote these very plotless, moody short stories that were all <laughs> very veiled things about my feelings about the guy I had a crush on and like weird, unacknowledged retellings of the yellow wallpaper. Like that was it. <laughs> um, and so then at, when, when graduation was coming up, I, you know, I loved theater. I acted in college. I was like, I'm not going to act. So I, I was like, I could work in theater or in publishing. And I just applied for a ton of jobs. And the job I got was working at a talent agency because mm. um, I hadn't like done any internships mm -hmm. or anything. And so I worked in theater for a while, first at an agency and then in new play development, which was like the beginning of my editing work that I had those instincts that I loved working with writers and helping them make their work help achieve their vision. Mm -hmm. I found that really satisfying, the sort of like uh, problem solving and like puzzle solving of that, like figuring out what they were trying to do and how they could get there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Great Recession hit and I got laid off, which was really a blessing because I the theater I worked at uh, had really bad morale and I was very unhappy. And so I was like, okay, I tried okay. theater for a while. Let me go back to writing. And I had at that time been doing a lot of theater blogging when I was sitting okay. at my desk and not doing my job, which was a lot of the time, um, I had started a theater blog and actually had like, you know, made some friends through that. Um, one of whom has become a really fantastic nonfiction writer in his own right, Isaac Butler, who wrote this remarkable book about the method, like the acting method, which um, our paths continued in parallel for a little while, okay, as okay. you'll see. So um, I got a job as a receptionist and I was like, okay, I'll write. And I would like go to the coffee shop with my laptop and expect to just start writing a novel. <laughs> and it did not happen. 
Um, and that was when I did that reflection. I was like, you know, mm -hmm. I never was very good at coming up with plot, but I really liked my nonfiction class. And so I started writing some essays. And then this friend, Isaac, who had been a theater blogger like me, um, he went to get his MFA in creative nonfiction at the University of Minnesota. And I was like, well, if Isaac can do that, I can do that. And so I went to an info session for the creative nonfiction MFA at Columbia and just completely fell in love. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, no, I really want to do this, even though I mm -hmm. knew it was like a very foolish financial choice. My thinking being that I could, there was nothing an MFA would offer me that I couldn't do myself, but it would just take me five times as long to do the work, to build myself as a writer, to make those connections. Um, and so I went to Columbia and in my first semester, my workshop professor mentioned he was, that there was a science writing group on campus. Um, ah, cool. It was run out of the biology department. It was for scientists and writers doing science writing. Um, I was, that's when I was like, oh, wait a second, I love science, I should go. Mm -hmm. um, and that that really set me on my path. I didn't only do science writing in grad school. You know, I wrote personal essays. I did some food writing, things like that. Um, but that really inspired me to to put all this together because I'd always loved science. It had always come naturally to me. Um, and I even thought about double majoring in theater and physics in undergrad, partly because it just sounds so cool. You know, oh, yeah, no, I double major in theater and physics. Yeah, no big um, deal. <laughs> but my senior year of high school, I like didn't do my calculus homework enough and I really fell behind. Um, so, but it, it had always come easily to me and I really felt, comp it didn't even occur to me to question, like I can explain science. That's a thing that I knew I had. Um, and so I started incorporating science writing into my creative nonfiction. And that mm -hmm. was also really happenstance. I don't think I knew that science journalism graduate programs existed if yeah. I, if these realizations had happened in a different order i might have been a science journalist but instead i was in a creative writing program mm -hmm. um and so i you know took classes in the journalism school at columbia in science writing there's like one science writing creative nonfiction class that was offered i took that and then um, my second semester, every nonfiction student in the program had to take a research seminar where mm -hmm. you learn sort of archival and library research methods and um, spend the semester working on a piece of writing that's built out of research. And uh -huh. so I said, okay. I said to my professor, you know, you had to pick a topic. And I said, I want to write about the golden record, the Voyager golden record. Ah. And she said, that's too narrow. Just write about aliens overall and I was like well that's very large <laughs> yeah how's that going <laughs> and that well this is how it's going it took me 10 <laughs> years but I wrote the book um and so that was really the beginning of it that and that semester also one of the requirements of the program was to take at least one class outside of the creative writing program one class in another department at the university and it turned out that that spring one of the offerings in the astronomy department was exoplanets and astrobiology um, and my microphone okay. is actually resting on my textbook from that class right now, because even though I couldn't do calculus, the professor let me in because I was like, look, I have to take it pass fail. I'll brush up on calculus, you know, over break so I can at least follow the lectures and him letting me in that class just really opened up so much because I learned a lot of the foundational science and so that I really had um, a, a tiny bit of my own knowledge to draw right. on in my writing. And, you know, that was really it. I loved that writing project. I loved that class. I started writing after that for a website called Astrobytes that is um, staffed by graduate students. Other than me, they're graduate students in astronomy and astrophysics, writing mm. summaries of new research articles aimed at an undergrad physics audience so that undergrad oh, students cool. can sort of learn what's going on in the field and, and you know, learn about astronomy and astrophysics. Um, but the only requirement to be a writer is that you're a graduate student. There's nothing that says you can't be an MFA student. <laughs> and I, you know, applied and, and was accepted. And so I got to write these digest write-ups of new research for a couple of years. And so that was a great way to learn about what was going on in the field and really just immerse myself. Um, but then, so I wanted to, I had the idea of, I want to write a book about this. But then I would go to the bookstore and look on the bookshelf and, you know, half a dozen books on 
the possibility of life on other worlds already exist. And they're all written by scientists. They're all written by people with PhDs. Right. And so it took yeah. me a long time to figure out what my book could be that, mm -hmm. you know, wasn't something that was already written 10 times over by people with a lot more expertise than I have. Yeah. And then, so I guess two, two kind of interesting things that I kind of want to parse out is your difference between your writing and editing. So I guess we'll yeah. get into the editing in a second, but then for the writing process, like it, you, you obviously are, are at least to me known as kind of a science journalist and writer, mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, because the subject matter and topics, et cetera. But like, you also have, you know, you said you background in theater. So I'm assuming mm -hmm. some screen screenwritings in there, some nonfiction, uh, some, yeah. some creative fiction. And then I, have I heard it through the grapevine of, of research, uh, some romance novels as well. Okay. And so then... <laughs> that's not, that's not as a writer. That's as a critic. Okay. 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 And okay even so... when I worked in theater, you know, I worked as a dramaturg and so people often assumed that I also was a playwright and I was like, no, 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 no. Like my brain does not do that. Do that. I, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Same with romance. Like I, I reviewed romance novels, got it, but I've, got it, got I it. just, I've accepted that my brain doesn't do fiction. I, I see, love I fiction. I love novels, but my brain just doesn't work that way. Okay. So then maybe if we focus on the, the writing, uh, pro the writing kind of area, but maybe focusing on the writing process. So like, how is your kind of like process, I guess, changed over the years? Cause I'm assuming with a little bit more research and working with the bites and other, you know, things like that, you kind of have honed in a little bit. So, I mean, what has that process been for you cumulatively? And then how do you kind of take, uh, I guess, writing as a process nowadays? Yeah, I, I'm really interested in writing as a process. And part of that is because I also teach, which mm -hmm, is really mm -hmm. tied up with my editing. So I can I can sort of talk about both things at once. Sure. Because in grad school, I got a fellowship to teach um, freshman composition. Okay. And so like teaching is not a requirement at my MFA program. It's like more of a competitive thing. And I was really lucky to get this job teaching first year composition for two years. And okay. I learned so much from that because my writing education before that had or at least had not gotten into my head in any really like concrete skills based way it was much more mm. intuitive um instinctual but teaching you know academic essay writing i learned a lot of concrete skills i learned how to look at why something works or why something doesn't and diagnose it and say here are the choices that the writer is making that are giving the reader the experience they're having. Here is why that transition feels like it flows. Here is why that paragraph feels like it follows or doesn't feel like it mm -hmm. follows. And how do you mm -hmm. change that? I learned a lot of skills for revision, for really deliberately diagnosing a piece of writing and then um, you know, continuing to develop it through revision. And I came to really believe in revision as a really meaningful part of the process because um, you know, you that you can't expect or even hope for something perfect to come out on the first try. I let go of a lot of perfectionism and knowing that you're going to have a lot of work in revision really freed up my writing process to be more exploratory, to make more discoveries, because I'm not worrying about is it good when I'm writing a first draft? I'm just discovering what my ideas are, discovering connections, discovering fun combinations of words. Um, and so teaching composition was really, really meaningful to me in like learning, developing a, a really mindful, deliberate process Yes. Um, and thinking about the different stages of my process and feeling more in control of it rather than waiting for the muse to sing to me. Um, a book that was really, really helpful for me in that way was the artist way the artist's way by Julia Cameron. And that's like a it's like a 12 week sort of self-help course in uh, I believe the way she puts it is like uh, discovering your inner artist or like connect I think gotcha. of it as a way to connect more with your inner creativity okay. um, but and so it's a little a little woo woo but it is also just there are a lot of really meaningful exercises and practices in there for freeing up your imagination and your creativity so that you know I took a lot from that book into my process and so now my writing process, um, I, I sort of go, something really important in the process that I learned from teaching composition is separating generating from assessing from planning. Ah, so when okay. you're writing, you're writing and you're not worried about 
if it's good. Then you look at what you have and you assess it, not in terms of good or bad, but just what's there, what's it doing, and then you figure out a plan of what you want to do next. And by separating those three elements really deliberately, that means you're only doing one thing at a time. Yep. Like when people talk about writer's block, it almost always is because they're worried about their writing being bad, which mm -hmm. then stops them from writing. Yeah. But if you have a robust process and you know that future you will take care of you <laughs> and it doesn't matter if it's good or bad you're just trying to generate and discover ideas and then future you will say okay what's here what can we do with this how do we rearrange it what else do we need it really um takes away a lot of that self-consciousness can get in, that can get in the way yeah. and then te teaching was also what opened the door for me to editing mm -hmm. is the other thing i was gonna say well, so if, if teaching, like, I guess, how do you kind of instill in your students or in, in, in yourself, I guess, as well? Because, I mean, with myself, I guess my biggest thing is uh, I know it's an iterative process. I know mm -hmm. it's a it's a it's a whole kind of thing. You have to do it. But then at the same time, I guess for me is obviously some imposter syndrome comes through, but it, it's like more the, 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 I guess the internal clock in my mind, like, oh, if I go down a road, that's kind of a, a, a dead end. Well, that's like wasting time on, on the, the other stuff that I could be writing about other than thinking that that's a part of the process that like going down through that dead end and then crossing it off the list is just mm -hmm. as important sometimes as actually writing what that list is. So, I mean, how do you do that? How do you instill in your students? Cause I think that's a big big thing of, of some people like I guess some people nowadays are using chat GBT for ideation just to start it up just to start it up those kind of yeah. things I'm not saying like copy paste but maybe that is a is a novel thing or not maybe maybe not so what, mean, what are your I, thoughts <laughs> like, I mean I was rolling my eyes about chat GBT <laughs> because chat GBT is just fancy plagiarism yeah yeah I, I, 100%, so, I would agree. um and and we chat GPT can't do anything new but the human mind can make new things. Your mind, 100%. anyone's mind can make something new. And so um, not a big fan of chat GPT. I would like chat, I would like machine learning to do my taxes and I would like yes. a robot to clean my house and free <laughs> up space for me to do creativity, not yes. for machine learning to do the creativity. dream of old. <laughs> yeah, it's like we're we're automating the exact wrong things. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But so for me, Part of it was working through the artist's way a couple of times and sort of really um, spending time with the idea of myself as an artist and as a creator. Oh, okay, okay. And as weird and uncomfortable okay. as that might feel when you get started, it changes how you think of the work because then the work is not about just creating a product. The work is about making something new and making yeah. discoveries and you well, know so. really that that cr like bringing something new into the universe which is like very powerful and meaningful and changes the meaning of going down a dead end because then it's not a dead end it um is part of the process yeah, yeah. i also you know it takes a lot of time i now know my writing process a lot better and i know that there will be bad drafts and there that i know how to work with them and mm. um that sometimes you have to the dead end isn't a dead end you're not going all the way back to where you were after you write to the dead end you know things that you didn't know before yep. you have written sentences that you had never written before and you've thought through ideas that you haven't thought through before and so when you throw that in the garbage you're not back at the, you're in a new place still um, and I also have just really come to enjoy the messy first draft that sort of just like <laughs> free flowing brain vomit, you know, open nice. the faucet and see what comes out. I find that really enjoyable, separate from the quality of the output. Like it's I just see. a pleasurable process to sort of do that messy free writing. As for how I help my students through it, um, I think it's really important to build that time and the expectations into class. Mm -hmm. into the syllabus so it's mm -hmm. not like i'm saying here's when the final draft is due i expect you to do a bunch of revision in the middle um you sort of you build it out and you structure it and you say okay on this date i want you to you know have a free 
first, there's doing a lot of free writing in class, a lot of like, take five minutes and just write on this topic. You don't have to show it to me. You don't have to show it to anyone. Just get some thoughts on the page. Nice. And that starts showing students that that can be a really helpful part of the process. Not for everyone, but if half the students go, ooh, I really like doing these focused free writes. They're helpful for me to discover my ideas. They might, they might take that with them into their own other work when it's not mandated yep. by the professor. And then they have discovered that writing can be useful beyond just turning in a finished product, that writing mm -hmm. is thinking, writing is discovery. And so that starts planting that seed. We also do multiple drafts. We get lots of feedback on drafts. I share about my process, but I basically say like, you have to turn in a draft on this date. And then two weeks later, you're turning in a final draft and here's the feedback and they do some reflection. And you know, when they turn in their final draft, they write a paragraph about how it's a substantial revision of the first draft. And so it's it's expected and they have the time that they wouldn't necessarily have in a class that wasn't explicitly teaching them writing. Mm, so it's really point. just like going through all of the steps, really deliberately reflecting on the steps so they can start to get a sense of what works best for them. Does their brain like outlining or does, does their brain like free writing to discover and then seeing what they have? No, I mean, the iterative process is super interesting and I've honestly uh, learned a lot about it this semester. I'm doing a fellowship with our English Writing Center. So mm -hmm. I just actually TA'd for this uh, thesis writers workshop, you know, two weeks ago. And I haven't even, I, I do my thesis, you know, next semester, but yeah, it's super interesting to, to put on a writer hat and the editor hat. So I guess if we kind of uh, put, put off the writer's hat and take on the editor hat, um, yeah. talk us through kind of your experience as the series editor of Best American Science and Nature Writing. Like that, that's a, that I, I bet yeah. that's, a, that's a big undertaking of, of some sort. It is, it is. And it, so that actually doesn't include like editing the pieces because we're just anthologizing uh, okay, okay. edit, you gotcha. know, published work. Um, so that, you know, when I was in college doing theater, I did some acting, but I did a lot of production managing mm, and mm -hmm. working on the anthology actually draws on that, on the sort of like organization and logistics and wrangling 25 writers, you know, so, so my responsibility there is um, reading a lot of science writing throughout the year and or I'll be honest, reading a lot of science writing in December <laughs> as the deadline comes up from the whole year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And then at, in, at the very beginning of January, I send a list of about 100 pieces to the guest editor. Every year, the anthology has a different science writer guest editing that book and so i say mm -hmm, here's mm -hmm. you know a hundred great pieces to get you started and they can choose they make the selections for the book so they can choose from my list from their own it's usually a mix um and then after they've made their selections i do the work of like emailing the writers to tell them and collecting their contact info and things like that and you know doing a pass of 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 looking at the book proofs for errors and you know that sort of production management type stuff um but it's great because it means I read a ton of science journal journalism and science essays and nature writing um, and really have to hone a quick sense of what I think is great. Um, and I've just gotten to, you know, gotten to know a bunch of writers and I love getting to bring people good news, sending the email that says congratulations. You, you have a piece selected for best American science and nature writing, because for a lot of people, that's a big dream. And it's actually a yeah. dream that I had to let go of when I took on this role, because at least while I'm working on it, I can't uh, have yeah. any work <laughs> in the <laughs> anthology, um, which is a fine, it's a fair trade. Can you slip uh, in a preface, you know? I, like just, well, no, I actually do. So okay, okay, okay. The, guest editor you writes the, there. <laughs> the guest editor writes the introduction and I write a forward. So I do okay. have cool, cool. like a small essay in there um every every year but yeah it's so yeah that's, that's so, well it that sounds much is. more like a producer to be honest with you it is. you know it like really that is. that yeah. seems like a lot of logistical work organization yeah. etc so i could see how that's kind of uh i guess just briefly can you talk a little bit about some of the qualities you know of like what i guess you could say best is because i'm assuming yeah. from year to year different you know things maybe themes etc like how how does that kind of shift from from year to year or is it just hey I, I read it, I feel it, that's a good piece of writing. Or that's that's like honestly how that's how okay. I work for the most yeah. part with this. I'm looking for a piece that really grabs me that yeah. um where the writing is powerful and and beautiful and not just, you know, like the writing is an important part of it, the prose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um I do care that the work feels ethical. 
um, that's not a problem that comes up very often. But like, for example, I don't think I have or would ever have um, that I would ever choose or like to nominate a piece that, um, you know, felt exploitative of its subjects okay. or um, or sort of um, promoted like a sort of colonist view if they were writing about um, Native people. Um, I also would never include anything that was like pro weight loss or sort of demonizing mm. fatness because that's mm -hmm. something that's important to me and that can be very fraught in mm -hmm. science. Sure. Um, but I think like the medical or like ideal of... body types, that kind of stuff. Exactly. Is that... yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. You know, that. like there there are many medical professionals and some science writers who buy into the thinking that, you know, being fat is a personal failing or a major health risk when like the science is actually very ambiguous. There's a lot of just sort of like conventional wisdom about that that I think is really harmful. And so anything well, that felt yeah, well, I was just going to say the next thing immediately in my mind is thinking about like kind of the resurgence of, you know, r race science, you know, that kind of yeah, stuff I mean, is that in the popular media. Like that's not seems in like, like a, yeah, yeah, absolutely not. Like yeah, anything yeah. that just felt harmful in that way. And so th that, you know, I do sometimes get letters from readers who are irritated with what they feel is the politicization of the book largely for pieces about climate change mm, uh which mm -hmm. this is me rolling my eyes at them I'm like okay yeah. thank you <laughs> you know people who think that the book is too depressing because there's like stuff about fires and extinction and whatever and i'm like a th sorry that's what the great writing was about yeah, yeah, yeah. um and b this is what science is you know so like a couple of my forwards have been about like have been a sort of response to the idea that the book is too political they're like i just want science i don't want politics i'm like there is no boundary yeah. all science is political all art is political all of our life choices are political um i definitely in one of those like included a quote from tony kushner about political art and i was like same goes for science like it's all has like this is not an escape from politics this is part of the world just like everything else is yeah I mean, as a budding social science researcher in SDS, yeah. so love it, love it, can hear it yeah. uh, loud and clear. But I also, um, I mean, some of that, I, I think like the zeitgeist ha has gotten around finally, I guess you could say, to art and science and subjectivity, but they mm -hmm. haven't gotten to the politiliz politicalization of things just yet. That zeitgeist just hasn't gone over the threshold. Um, yeah. But hopefully more social science, things like that uh, can talk. And I guess one of the things you just mentioned, like about the science, I mean, go, someone can go read David Wallace Wells' Uninhabitable yeah. Earth and go talk about the science if we hit four degrees centigrade, like. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, it's like they like, say, I, you know, get your politics out of my science. I'm like, this is the science. Yeah, yeah. The the Straight science up. is this isn't like it's not separate. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. science is influencing. I don't know. Science is telling us about the world, and then political choices have to be made. I don't know. It's just it's <laughs> no worries. I mean, they that's don't a, that's like a... this. It's making them uncomfortable, and they don't right. like that. That so like I just want to read about a cool <laughs> kind of monkey and i'm like well where's that monkey's habitat man Come yeah on. well well i think I th this is a great transition into not just your book but then also i guess a middle middle uh, a uh, uh a linking point is is your time when you were at future tense yeah um, you know talk us through that experience a little bit love you know the publication and then also mm -hmm. um I, here's three essays that i just found like really, oh yeah really could astrobiology research convince us to fight climate change step yep. one realize we're not alone uh, second, if the earth isn't special, then the whole cosmos is amazing things happen when you realize earth is just another planet. And then uh, surely there will, there must be someone <laughs> out there in all that space. Right. So one was for popular science. The other two was uh, for slate, which is, you know, future tent, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, a publication mm -hmm. of slate. Um, so talk us through that. And then I guess you can segue into a little bit of your experience there uh, into kind of these essay writings and then mm -hmm. kind of getting to, to a full length book. Yeah, so so Future Tense is a collaboration of Slate, Arizona State University, and New America, which is a uh, a think tank. Yep. And so it's it's a you know it looks like it's a section of Slate that publishes writing at the intersection of science, tech, and policy. Um, and so I got a job 
editing there, you know, I've been freelance since like 2017. And so that was a part-time job. It was really perfect, perfect situation in that sense. Um, And so I was, you know, editing there. I think I worked there for maybe two years or so. And um, so, so, you know, I had gotten into editing by using my teaching experience by like framing my teaching experience as editing experience. And so my first job was um, doing some sort of books content editing at Google. Luckily, the person hiring was someone I knew. So I was able to be like, yes, I taught for two years. That that counts as editing experience. (laughs) And so from there, that was like really how I pivoted my resume. Um, But, right, you know, editing for Future Tense was really wonderful because I got to just cover so much territory Mm -hmm. um and it also turned out to be really wonderful you know being connected to slate during the first years of the pandemic because i i had been working remotely anyway but then everyone was working remotely but you know there was a really robust um employee slack so i i had a, a community that way of colleagues and was very connected to very smart science journalists and science editors uh you know so i felt like i as much as someone could, you know, knew, knew what to do and knew what was going on. Um, And so I was editing, you know, a few pieces a week by journalists and sometimes by scientists and scholars about all sorts of things, you know, the, the idea of the intersection of tech and science and policy and like our lives is really broad. I edited an essay about um, neoliberalism and Oh gosh, uh, and cyberpunk, oh, which was cool. fantastic. Okay, okay. Yeah, and yeah, I like yeah. learned so much. Um, I edited one by someone who, um, during the pandemic, got really into uh, like plane spotting apps and okay. sort of watching planes going overhead and like the app on her phone. And so, and then you know, reporting on uh, you know the future of bananas with like a possible um, you know fungus that was going to sweep through and kill all the bananas and like what researchers were doing to fight that so (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah it was it was great and one of the nice things about being there is i had a very easy in for pitching my own work and my my boss the wonderful tori bosch who's now at stat news um was really encouraging so like when a story would come up about space she would ask me if I wanted to write it or a couple times I would have an idea for something and be like I'm gonna find a freelancer to write this and I would like try a couple people and be like you know what I want to write this yeah yeah yeah, um (laughs) and so it was great to have a home base like that because before future tense you know I had written that piece for popular science I had done some and I had you know my years writing for astrobytes but it was really hard to do science journalism as part of my work Mm -hmm. um you know whether as a freelancer or a staff writer i was also doing other things i was writing about books i was teaching i was reviewing romance novels as you mentioned and um i just without with you know i was spread too thin to really keep keep up with what was going on in science in astronomy um it just I, i wasn't i felt like i needed to be fully immersed in order to do it but as time went on i sort of started finding my little zone my sweet spot with these um more essayistic writings about science so it wasn't um reporting on the news but it was reflecting on the work you know looking at the meaning of things um and actually like the origin for my book aside from that class in grad school that really first got me going was in like 2016 or 2017 a friend was Um, working freelance as an editor for Medium, and she was looking for writers to write essay series on culture. And she asked me if I had any ideas. And I was like, what about aliens through a cultural lens? Mm -hmm. And she said, yes. Um, And so I wrote this essay series and, you know, figured out five or six topics that I would write about. And the third one was looking at um, aliens in sci-fi and talking to scientists and sort of putting that in conversation. Like, what do scientists think about aliens in sci-fi? What can we learn from all that? And the essay was supposed to be something like 2000 words. And I was writing and I kept going and I kept going and I kept going. And I was like, I could write a lot about this. Oh, that's awesome. And, um, and then I realized that that was the little gap on the bookshelf. 
And, you know, mm -hmm. there were all these astronomers who had written books about whether or not, what are the odds, how are we going to find it, when are we going to find it, but no one had written about how we imagine aliens yeah. and looking at the science as an imaginative project. And that was just when it really, I was like, oh, there's my book and there's the role for me, a creative writer, an essayist, mm -hmm. rather than a journalist, rather than a scientist. This is the book that I can write that they couldn't write and I can't write the book that they've already written. No, that's a, that's a very cool story. And I guess getting into, um, I, the, the, the book, uh, it's coming out soon, uh, in the, in the coming days, by the time this comes out, it will definitely be out. I'm, I'm assuming. So, uh, <laughs> so the possibility of life, science, imagination, and our quest for kinship in the cosmos. So as I mentioned to you earlier, I had a good, uh, you know, little skim through, read through the intro and the, and the last, uh, on, on Easter weekend and, and was, uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I, I think your writing is very pithy and, and kind of matter of fact, uh, there's kind of no, like, uh, beating around the bush, if you will. <laughs> um, but I really liked uh, this introductory quote you used in the uh, Watchful Stars, the, the name of the introduction. Quote, some people are drawn to science by their drive to understand. But what, what I've always loved most is how science shows us what we don't know, how little we understand of the world, even as we're inextricably a part of it. It didn't want, uh, I didn't want to answer questions, but discover mysteries instead. Mysteries with tantalizing possibilities, theories and hypotheses, hypotheses and whispers of the truth. Very well done. I, lo I lo <laughs> love that at the end, that little series that you put in. Uh, so Thank what, you. Kind of, I guess, talk us through what kind of the thesis of the book, what were you trying to kind of do other than, you know, like you said, fill a bookshelf, a whole, and <laughs> kind of like, what, what did you learn along the journey? You know, I guess that'll be the easiest. Yeah. Well, I, the thesis of the book is actually, um, does have to do with that hole on the bookshelf a little, because it's really about adding to the conversation and looking at how the conversation has been undertaken and what other ways we can look at mm -hmm. these questions, which is a way of framing that I learned when I was teaching first year composition, you know, that you, you listen to the conversation that's going on and you figure out how can I dip in my or what is what yep. is my contribution. And it's in response to this ongoing conversation that's been going on for centuries, and will continue after my book. And so the, the basic thesis is that um, we tend to think of this as a question of whether or not are there aliens or not? Is there life on other worlds or not? Is it likely? Is it rare? We think of it in odds, probabilities, and just like binaries. Mm -hmm. um, and my thesis is that while that is a necessary and important scientific question, it's not a meaningful question to like a regular person. What's really more worth digging into and also the answer to the whether or not question would be meaningful, but the question itself, there's nothing to chew on, mm -hmm, but a, mm -hmm. a, a chewier question is what if, mm -hmm. what if there are aliens out there, what are the implications, what would it mean, what might they be like, what could we learn from how we imagine that, and what does that reflect back on us, and what is the role of these imaginings in science and in our culture. You know, another sort of part of the book's argument is that science is an imaginative project that because if you think about it, like a hypothesis is a work of imagination. It's a prediction. It's an extrapolation. Um, and devising experiments is hugely imaginative and innovative and creative. And so, so that is, you know, another one of the underlying foundations of the book is that science is imaginative. It's a work of imagination that we approach answers through creative, imaginative work. Um, and that we can learn a lot about the science through fictional imaginings. We can learn a lot about the fictional imaginings through the lens of science and that all of these imaginings, like, yes, the scientific answers are valuable, but the work of the science and the pro and, you know, all of the fictional works are reflections of ourselves and their ways of understanding their ways of seeking meaning, seeking, um, you know, new lenses through which to understand humanity. And part of why we want to find other examples of life is to better understand life on Earth. And so my argument is that we can already do that now looking through these imaginings as those reflections. 
basically you you summed up that point in a little bit uh quote imagining extraterrestrial life is a way of figuring out what it means to be a conscious animal what it means to be a mat to be matter and alive and then here's the kicker uh that i really loved our visions of space are a reflection of ourselves and our humanity like the building blocks of a telescope a mirror and a lens so again well well done because that's you. exactly <laughs> what it kind of feels like um, yeah but but so if it's a mirror and a lens, I mean, you start off talking origins, planets, animals, people, technology, contact, uh, and then you finish us off uh, with a great conclusion. But I guess I, walk us in a little bit. Just I I don't want to I don't want to get too bogged down into terms because I think a lot of people already know like Drake equation, the yeah. Goldilocks zone, Fermi paradox, abiogenesis. Um, the Fermi paradox, which I have to say, I am very proud. I wrote the book without mentioning. <laughs> okay, so I didn't mention it at all. Oh wow, I, I don't didn't search it at so. all. Because so like the Drake, the Drake equation comes up in the introduction. And I realized, looking back that the structure of the book is very inspired by the way of thinking of the Drake equation, where it's like, yes, yes, what are the in the Drake equation, it's what are the variables that we would need to know in order to know how who else how many transmitting civilizations might be out there at this moment. And so the Drake equation was never meant to be solved. It was an agenda setting exercise. He wrote it on the board and he said, if we wanted to know the number, we would need to know all these factors. So these factors are the topics we should be discussing. Similarly, my book chapters, like you just listed, are organized by these topics that are like, if we, what are the various things we need to imagine in order to imagine alien life and so we need mm -hmm. to imagine how life begins we need to imagine planets so that there's a place for aliens to be etc cetera, etc cetera. um so i find the drake equation very very meaningful i find the fermi paradox kind of irritating because <laughs> it's like there are a million answers like calm down yeah, 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 you know yeah, yeah. Think that, uh, and and in earlier writings about the topic, like the writing I was doing in grad school, I definitely opened some essays or chapters with, you know, in 1950, whatever, Enrico Fermi and some friends from Alamo, Los Alamos, were sitting around eating lunch, and they were talking about this New Yorker cartoon about flying saucers with the garbage can lids, and Fermi did a couple scribbles on a napkin, and then he looked up and he said, "Where is everybody?" You know, yeah, yeah. but it's just like. <laughs> It's one of those things that if you've heard that story, if you haven't heard that story before, it's interesting, but I've, I'm so sick of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like, um, when you teach essay writing, one of the cliches is that the word essay comes from the French essay, which means to try. So an essay is an attempt. Ah. It's not meant to be decisive. Right. And so when you've never heard it before, it's actually okay. really interesting yeah. when you get your MFA and then work <laughs> in like the essay world for 20 years, it's like, it's yes. a cliche and i used it. that i used essay is to try in my um in my class that i teach my creative nonfiction class that i'm teaching this semester and i was like here we go i'm gonna do it for real but it's like it's like a joke in a yeah, way yeah. you know totally. oh it's to try um see i feel the same about the fermi paradox it's like okay where is everybody well, let me tell you eight million places they could be they could be <laughs> So what what did your what what is your favorite I I mean I don't want to say favorite but I guess most intriguing variable because for me I think the three for me that is is huge is single cell to multi cell like the endo yeah, symbiosis like what yep, that is like, that is totally it. okay well like, honorable is, mentions honorable okay. mentions panspermia yeah pans, panspermia where basically life was say on Mars an asteroid but hits see, that's Mars just, that's just passing the buck it has, yeah, yeah, yeah. To evolve. it has to start somewhere it does it does and then time time we're too early we're too late whatever like yeah you know, time scales but okay so talk us through endo okay. symbiosis <laughs> so endo symbiosis like i and this is where i end the book because i sort of promise at the beginning of the book that i'm not going to get into odds and probabilities <laughs> and then at the end of the book i'm like okay there is one. let's do it <laughs> um and so this is the idea that so basically life arose on earth just about as soon as it could, like as soon as conditions were okay, bacteria and archaea popped up. Um, but then for 2 billion years, that's all that there was. N and not just that they were single celled organisms, but that they were um, prokaryotes, they were simple cells without a nucleus or any internal structure. And the interesting thing about prokaryotes is that they are wildly innovative in terms of chemistry. They can share and acquire new advantageous genes by horizontal gene transfer. So they oh. don't have to wait for like random mutation and sort of giving genes to their offspring. They sort of just like 
because they don't have that inner structure, because their genes are not sequestered in a nucleus, it's almost like their genes are contagious. And even mm. now, this is how um, antibiotic resistance spreads. We're like, if you've got one antibiotic resistant species, everyone around it can pick it up. Um, but they don't ever evolve structurally. They just don't have inner structure. So they don't have, they, they in 2 billion years, they, their shapes didn't really change. And then at some point, there is this event of endosymbiosis in which, oh no, I can't remember. I think a bacteria gobbled up an archaea, but it might've been the other way around. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, but it, one, one goes inside the other, one, right? right. Like that's the whole thing. One, and then it's a symbiotic relationship. Exactly. Between... That okay. one of these microbes came to live inside another microbe. And that is the origin of our mitochondria. So mm -hmm. in our cells, in the cells of all complex organisms, of all, you know, um, complex single celled organisms like, uh, you know, paramecium or whatever, the stuff that you saw under a microscope in high school, the big single cells. Well, there are big bacteria, but um, it seems like the first, the thing that kicked off and permitted all of the other complexity was the acquisition of mitochondria, which are energy generators. And one theory that I am fond of go, says that with that new source of energy, cells had the ability to put energy into building all this comp these complex structures. They now had more energy. And so the nucleus arose and another act of, symbiosis, of endosymbiosis gave some cells chloroplasts. So they could, you know, make energy from, or, you know, sugar from sunlight. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And you get nuclei and you get uh, ribosomes and lysosomes and the endoplasmic reticulum and all these other words that you learned in 10th grade biology and maybe haven't thought about since. Um, and what blows my mind is that we know, so mitochondria have their own genomes. They have just the genes they need okay. to make the proteins that they need. And that's passed down um, on the mother's line, at least in, you know, organisms that have mothers. Um, and so we can see from that, that these were once independent organisms. And we can see that it happened once. Every cell with mitochondria shares, it, is, it seems, a common origin. And the odds of that happening, the odds of one little blob gobbling up another little blob in this really advantageous, mutually beneficial energy creating the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, it wigs me out. Because it took 2 billion years to happen. So that makes it seem like it was not easy, it was not cheap, the way that the origin of life may have been. So... There are people who point out that it happened twice because it also happened with chloroplasts and maybe it was happening all the time. So little blobs of cells, and I say blobs because they didn't have like internal structures, prokaryotes mm -hmm. to be more respectful to them. Prokaryotes were sucking up other prokaryotes all the time. And maybe this is the one that survived just like all life on earth has a common ancestor, but maybe there were many origins of life and this is just the one that outcompeted the others. Yep. So maybe, okay. This was just the, the, but I don't know, 2 billion years for it to happen. And then it just happens once. And it seems so important to all complex life Yeah, yeah. to have that, that new source of energy to um, do these expensive things like building internal structure, like developing multicellularity, developing cell specialization. Um, it could not happen without mitochondria. So some thinking goes. So I guess my, my question is, my, my second to last question, are you more excited about like the James Webb Space Telescope and finding exoplanet life markers and stuff mm -hmm. like that? Or are you more interested in like, you know, our culture creating good pieces of art that then talk about kind of the possibility, like you said, because I mean, Arrival, First Contact, there's so many other movies, there's so many books, things like that. Yeah. Um, what, what is kind of your thinking on that? Because I know the whole point of this book was more culture and not the science, but then if science actually kind of gets closer, to, no, how, I mean, how, how I, do you think of that? I love the science. Like I oh, love yeah, yeah, the yeah, science. Sure, sure. I feel more excited about the scientific possibilities because getting them feels harder. 
Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Okay, that makes we sense. We have lots of brilliant sci-fi, and we will continue to. Um, we already have mind-blowing brilliant sci-fi. But what JWST is promising and like other telescopes and other Mars missions, that's new. That's like completely, completely new. So the idea of, um, you know, getting the spectra of exoplanet atmospheres and starting to see if there might be hints of life, it's not going to give us a decisive answer, but um, it's going to give us a lot of exciting information that is going to shape the next decades or century of science. Um, if all goes well and, um, you know, new information about Mars and the idea of sending a mission to Europa, this is all really exciting to me because it's, it's adding information that like, it's harder to get. I'm not saying that I like telescopes better than I like novels, but, um, it also feels more eventful in a way, you know, and it's, it's all of these firsts right? and that, that feels really exciting because it adds material to the you know it adds raw material for imagination for speculation um but that is you know i do still love scientific knowledge and i you know we need both we need the imagination but we also want to keep learning more about the cosmos yeah no, I think the, a great uh, kind of paradoxical that you're kind of phrasing is is also what you put in the last line of your book. Uh, the stars cannot be counted, but each one can be named. Beautiful uh, writing. And I think that kind of sums up a lot of it. Last question. Um, I always ask, you know, people kind of uh, if, if when they experience the overview effect or could, what would they think? What would they do? You know, seeing the earth from space. How would you kind of play both sides of that science and culture, you know, thinking mm-hmm. about it uh, as we get out of here? <laughs> I feel like writing this book gave me the opposite of the overview effect, where instead of getting perspective from farther away, I got a different perspective from getting closer, Mm -hmm. where I came into writing this book knowing a lot about exoplanets, about the ways we imagine aliens. I'd read a lot of sci-fi. But what was new to me was learning a lot of the, um, the origin of life stuff, the cellular biology, some of the evolution because I've always been more of an astronomy person than a biology person. Um, And it's funny, a a friend who read the book, who's a biology person, like she writes about ocean creatures and things like that. She said that for a little, for a moment, the book made her into a space person. I said, that's funny because writing the book kind of made me into a biology person. Um, Oh, okay. (laughs) And I felt like, sort of like with the idea of endosymbiosis, but learning about that, learning about, you know, how cells work the the components the incredibly complex mechanisms and the real sense of luck Mm -hmm. both luck and necessity that biology works the way it does and that you know it's like it's right here i'm like looking at my hand and it's full of cells that are full of mitochondria that you know that are when you get down to it are using quantum tunneling to move electrons from spot to spot on the little, you know, molecular Rube Goldberg machine. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I like, that, Whoa. I know <laughs> like that, I, I don't feel like I need the overview effect because I've spent my whole adult life thinking about how earth is just a little speck and the cosmos is so big. But I think what's really meaningful is how rich life on earth is and how, alien life on earth is which is you know a lot of what i write about in the epilogue as you were as you were talking about like i really think that writing this book gave me a much richer appreciation for life on earth and much more awe that it exists and i don't think i need to be far away to see that it's amazing that it exists i feel like i want to get as close as possible Mm -hmm. and that's that's where that feeling comes from for me well said well said Well, cool. Thanks, uh, Jamie Green, for all the time. Uh, Thanks for coming on Conversations. Really appreciate it. Yeah, this has been awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much to Jamie Green. She is really the go-to person to talk about not just the science of life in the universe, but also what would that mean to culture and society back here on Earth? We hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as we did. Before we go, please like this video if you found the discussion generative and intriguing. Leave a comment about your favorite part of the episode or who we should interview next. And subscribe for more eclectic content. Until next time, Ad Astra.